Okay, in this video, we're going to use the second derivative to determine intervals in which a function is concave up or concave down. Now, if you haven't done it yet, I would definitely watch the video on second derivatives where we graphically talked about the relationship between the original function, um, the first derivative, and the second derivative. And it graphically shows where all this stuff comes from. So I would recommend watching that video first. And what we'll do to find the intervals where it's concave up or concave down, we're going to follow these six steps right here. And the idea is we will use the second derivative to find out where the function is concave up or concave down by using inflection points. But before we get to this, uh, this actually will make a little bit more sense if you think about rather than concave up or concave down, let's go back and just briefly review how to find where a function was increasing or decreasing. Now, in a previous video, we used the first derivative to do that, and let's take a look at the rules. You'll see they almost look the same. Now, this is concave up or concave down. Let's compare that to increasing or decreasing. Now, this is what we did in a previous video. Um, used uh, the first derivative to find out where a function is increasing and decreasing. Now, let's quickly run through these steps, and you'll see how closely they relate to the ones we're going to do in this video. So first of all, if you want to know where a function is increasing or decreasing, the idea is that it switches from increasing to decreasing at the critical points. But remember, the critical points occur where the first derivative was equal to zero. So you did this series of steps. You found the first derivative and set it equal to zero, solve for x, and that gave you the critical points. Um, you then use the critical points to divide the graph up into a series of separate intervals. Then remember to figure out whether it's increasing or decreasing, you picked a convenient test point inside each interval and evaluated uh, the first derivative at that test point. Then the way it worked was if the first derivative turned out to be positive at a test point, then the original function was increasing in that interval. If the derivative turned out to be negative, it was decreasing in the interval. So the idea is that you find increasing or decreasing you use the first derivative and critical points. Now, look how similar this series of steps is to the process that's involved in that. Okay, now if you're looking for uh, intervals where it's concave up or concave down, <clears throat> the only difference is rather than using the first derivative and critical points, you're going to use the second derivative and inflection points. Because remember, uh, what an inflection point is, an inflection point is where it switches from concave up to concave down or concave down to concave up. Uh, the inflection points occur where the second derivative is equal to zero. So we'll follow almost exactly the same series of steps that we had before. Uh, let's kind of run through these. So the idea is you're, you want the second derivative, but to get the second derivative, you're going to need the first derivative. So the first step is go ahead and find the first derivative. Then step two, go ahead and find the second derivative. Now, you're looking for the inflection points. They occur where the second derivative is equal to zero. So set the second derivative equal to zero and solve. That'll give you the inflection points. And again, just a reminder, those are points where the concavity changes. Now, once you've got the inflection points, you can use the inflection points to divide the graph up into a separate intervals, or it might be concave up or concave down. Then to figure out what's going on inside each interval, go ahead and pick a convenient test point inside each interval and evaluate the second derivative at that test point. And then remember, if the second derivative is positive, uh, the original function is concave up in that interval. If the second derivative is negative, then the original function is concave down in that interval. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, run through a first example. Okay, for the example we're going to use is this. Here's the function f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 4x cubed. Now, like in the previous examples, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to draw a number line because I think it makes it a little bit easier to picture what's going on as we run through this thing. <clears throat> so we'll go through each of the steps and we'll look back and review them. So the first step says go ahead here and find the first derivative. So in step number one, you need the first derivative. So we'll put step number one uh, right here and we want to find f prime of x. So the first derivative, f prime of x, and just go ahead and use the power rule on that. That will be 4x cubed minus 12x squared. So there's the first derivative. But when you're working with concavity, you're really interested in the second derivative. So let's go to step two. 
So what step two says is now just go ahead and find the second derivative. So step two says find the second derivative, and again we'll use the power rule. So this was going to be the second derivative. And the second derivative would be 12x squared minus 24x. So here is the second derivative. And I'll go ahead and put a little box around this. So I've got the second derivative. So now we go on to step three. <clears throat> and what step three says is this. Uh, you want to find the inflection points because that's where the concavity changes. Now to find the inflection points, the inflection points occur either where the second derivative is equal to zero or where the second derivative is undefined. Now in this problem we won't have to worry about where the second derivative is undefined because the original function is a polynomial and they're defined everywhere. So we'll just look at part A. So step three, set the second derivative equal to zero and solve for x to find the inflection points. So we'll go on to step three and what step three says is um, take the second derivative set it equal to zero, and solve for x. Now I'll do that by factoring. <clears throat> so uh, if a common factor is here, you can factor out a 12, you can factor out an x, and what's left over would be an x minus 2. So first of all, factor. <clears throat> now to solve this, set each factor equal to zero. So I'll set that factor equal to zero, and I'll set that factor equal to zero. So what this one gives me is x is equal to zero. There's one critical point, and then you have x minus two is equal to zero, or x is equal to two, and I call it a critical point, actually an inflection point. So what this gives me is the following. Um, where the second derivative is equal to zero, it occurs right there, that's an inflection point, which I'll call an IP, and this is an inflection point, and I'll call that and IP. So I've got two inflection points. Now just like in the previous video, I'm going to go ahead and mark those points on a graph and you'll see why here in a little bit. It'll make it a little bit easier to picture what's going on. <clears throat> so what I've got is this. At zero, I've got an inflection point. At two, and I'll put it over here, um, at two I've got an inflection point. So you have two inflection points. Now what that does, it actually divides the graph up into intervals. So we'll go ahead and look at our next step. So what step four says is this, use the inflection point to divide the graph up into separate intervals. So let's do that here. So what happens is, uh, I'll just go ahead and draw a line. I've got a line that goes from here, and you just kind of put a line on the graph. So from here, uh, it goes right down through this inflection point. There's one interval. And then another interval would be from here, and I'll go straight through here. Uh, and go down like this. Now what that gives me is three intervals. I've got one interval that goes like this. Um, I've got another interval in here. And you've got a third interval in here. So you've got three intervals. Now this one goes all the way up from negative infinity and this one goes way off to, part, to a positive infinity. <clears throat> so that's what the intervals look like. So now let's go to the next step. You've got to divide it up into intervals. Find out what's going on inside each step. So the next step says this, step number five. Pick a convenient test point inside each interval and evaluate the second derivative to see if it's positive or negative. So let's do that. Now by convenient test point, I like to pick integers. So I'm going to pick here, here's zero. I'm just going to pick a convenient integer and a good convenient integer here would be a negative one. Um, here, uh, the only integer in this range would be a 1, so I'll pick a 1. And then finally, a convenient test point out here would be another integer, 3. So I'll pick those three right there. Now, the step says, and again, this is going to be uh, step number 5, pick a convenient test point. So um, I'll put step number 5 right here. So this will be step number 5. So what I want to do is to evaluate the second derivative of those points. So I want f prime prime at the first test point, negative 1. Then I'm going to evaluate the second derivative at the second test point, which is a 1. And then finally evaluate the second derivative 
at the third test point, which would be at 3. Now remember, if it turns out to be positive, it's concave up. If it turns out to be negative, it's concave down. And all you've got to do is take a negative 1 and plug it into the second derivative. So this would be 12 times a negative 1 squared minus 24 times a negative 1. And when you evaluate this, you'll come out with a positive 36. Now, just like in the increasing and decreasing uh, videos, we're not concerned about the numerical value about this. The only thing that you care about is that this thing is positive. So if it's positive, what that tells you is that in this, inter in this uh, interval right here, it is concave And what I'll do is go up here, I'll put a little CU. So in this interval right here, this thing is going to be concave up in this interval. Now let's figure out what's going on in the second interval. So plug a 1 in this time. So in place of x, substitute a 1, uh, minus 24 times 1. And again, if you evaluate this, you'll come up with a negative 12. Now again, you're not concerned about the numerical value, just the negative. So this one turned out to be negative, which tells you in this center, the second interval here, it's going to be concave down. So concave down. And if you look at the rules, here's what we're doing. Um, again, if the second derivative is positive, it's concave up. If the second derivative is negative, it's concave down. Okay, so what I've got, I'll put a little CD up here for concave down in this interval. Now let's find out in the third interval. So this time plug the 3 in. So I've got 3 squared minus 24 times 3. And if you evaluate this, again you come up with a positive 36. But again, I'm only interested in the sign, so that's going to be positive which tells me that in this interval, again, it's going to be concave up. So this will be concave up over here. Now, you want to write the final answer in interval notation. So in this first interval, it's going to be concave up from negative infinity to zero. So the way you write that would be this, from negative infinity to zero with an open interval. In this interval, um, it's concave down in the interval between 0 and 2, so it's going to be concave down from 0 to 2. And then finally in this third interval, uh, it'll be concave up from 2 out to a positive infinity. So this is going to be 2, and that'll be true all the way up to a positive infinity. So what this gives you, this will actually be the answer to your question right here. So you want to know where it was concave up or concave down, and we'll kind of put a little box around this so it looks like this. And when you answer your questions, um, you have now identified uh, what's going on inside each interval. And it uh, changes at the inflection points. Now in this problem, you don't have to do this, but I think it helps sometimes if you sketch the graph. And if you actually sketch a graph of this thing, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, the graph would come down like this. Um, it will level off here just for a second. Now, I like to put the little hairs on this graph. If you watch the first video, I showed how I used hairs to describe concave up or concave down. Well, this is concave up, which means that in this interval, the little hairs on the graph would look like this. They're above the graph, and the graph is curving up. Now, it gets to an inflection point right here, Then what will happen is this. It switches to concave down, and if you actually drew the graph, here's what it would look like. It switches to concave down in this interval. It'll look something like this. So what that means is that in here, it is uh, concave down. So I'll put the little hairs going this way. It's concave down in this interval. Looks something like this. And then in this last interval, it switches back to concave up again. So what will happen is from here, it actually continues on and it curves, which is back to concave up here um, and goes off to infinity like this. So in this interval, um, 
the little hairs would go. But so I've got an inflection point right there, switches back to concave up over here. And again, that's a rough sketch of the graph, but it'll give you a little bit of an idea of what's going on. So concave up in this interval, concave down in this interval, concave up in this interval, and the concavity changes at the inflection points, which are right here and right here. And the question was, identify the intervals where it's concave up or concave down, and that's how you do it. So again, go back to the series of steps, and they look like this. And run through those steps, and it should guide you through to the solution.